put the words up yeah. my questions yeah. in there. Um, <clears throat> And the camera's from here up? No, it's, well, it's like um, your... About here? Yeah. Okay, that's good. So the, uh, so the, the legs are not in it? The yeah. legs aren't in it. Good. It's actually just above your elbow. Okay. So. All right. Okay. So, Dr. Cole... Tell, tell us why, tell me why you're here. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> There's been um, a lot written in the press uh, over the last two and a half years uh, about the suspension of my medical license in the state of New Jersey. Um, by uh, both local publications and by some um, British publications as well. And uh, a lot of what um, has been printed, uh, I think, and um, it's my opinion that it's been particularly unfair and biased. Uh, the majority of the stories, um, and I understand why uh, the newspapers do this, it's to sell newspapers, but the majority of the stories have really approached my case um, in, I feel, an unnecessarily sensationalist fashion without really wanting to tell the story and um, you know, all parts of the story. So um, I've spoken um, in other video clips about certain details uh, of my educational background and uh, the various events that I've gone through in my life. But I wanted to specifically address um, the, the articles, um, as I said, that have been written within the last two and a half years, um, so that um, uh, the public, uh, my patients, uh, people that know me, uh, will also get to hear uh, the other side of the story, uh, which um, these stories I don't think told. Mm -hmm. uh, so what are, they, what are they saying in the press over the past couple of years that you want to respond to or, or fix or clarify or re rebut? The uh, suspension of my <clears throat> New Jersey medical license started uh, with allegations from the medical board that I was supposedly not qualified to perform the procedures uh, that I had been performing uh, for about 10 years uh, successfully and safely. And uh, they were just allegations. Um, what type of procedures are? The uh, procedures that I had been performing um, fell under the umbrella of minimally invasive spine surgery. So they uh, were procedures such as minimally invasive discectomies uh, and minimally invasive fusions. And I've been performing these cases since about 2002. Um, and from 2002 uh, to 2012, um, I, in total, I had performed uh, 6,000 uh, spine procedures, uh, 800, 800 of which had been uh, the discectomies and the fusions. And with all of those procedures, um, I can categorically state that I did not have one patient that passed away, I had no major complications, and I had a very small number of minor complications. And again, as I've um, said before uh, and have communicated elsewhere, for spine surgery, the accepted complication rate uh, is anywhere between 5 to 15 percent. And if you look at my numbers, my complication rate is 0.1 percent, which is way below the average. And my clinical outcome rate, uh, or the uh, percentage of patients that actually get better, is between 90 to 95 percent, as compared to the average of 65 to 70 percent. Now these numbers um, were not communicated in any of the stories or the articles that were put out, because 
These stories were written by journalists that really don't have the necessary medical knowledge, experience or expertise to write uh, um, properly about an issue in medicine. And I think that's also part of the reason why they just grabbed onto the sensationalist headlines to get the story into the paper. But it has, in my opinion, uh, been a misleading uh, set of stories for the public. Mm -hmm. um, so, just to go back, those numbers that you mentioned, the 0.5% as opposed to 15%, are those numbers that someone can look up somewhere or, you know, um, vet, so to speak? Yes. The, um, like those numbers are according to whom? That that's just... Yeah. The, uh, the, 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 the accepted numbers uh, of complication rates um, are documented in numerous uh, uh, surgical and medical textbooks. Mm -hmm. um, within my practice, uh, from the time that I started in 2002, I kept a very close internal audit of all of the patients that I had treated. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the medical board uh, had um, taken this action against me, I had offered to let the medical board come in and do a, a complete audit of all of my cases and files because I've kept very close and accurate records of what complications I've had, how patients have done. And in terms of the, um, uh, what tools did I use to assess patients' outcomes? Uh, in spine surgery, there are, uh, a very, there are a number of psychological and disability um, surveys that are used, such as the Oswestry, uh, the SF36, and the VAS pain scale. And all of these tools I uh, incorporated and used in the practice, and the records of these are contained within the files of the patients. So, um, the outcomes of my practice are completely verifiable uh, if an independent observer were to come in and to audit those files. Is that possible? That, that, that is possible, yes. Okay. So that could be something that you could have done by a, an accounting firm or something. I mean, individuals can't come in and view these records, I would imagine, but um, some independent agency or firm could do that. How would you do that? Uh, c correct. In compliance with uh, the uh, patient privacy uh, statutes, um, uh, an outside, a licensed outside agency uh, that were looking to evaluate the competency of a physician would be able to come in and assess a certain number of the files. They would randomly pick uh, anywhere between 10 to 100 files and they would go through those files and they would use that uh, as the basis for their assessment and any recommendations. Okay. Awesome. So, um, one of the articles, just stay right there, let's see. Is that better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're, there was a little... Clint. ...of reflection in your glass. Okay, so... <clears throat> so one of the articles <clears throat> uh, uses the word... I did. So, one of the articles says that you, they use the word fled from um, Britain. Uh, what is that? I mean, that, that, that seems like you were running away from something. What, 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 was it, the, what was the incident that happened or the case that happened that, you know, they're saying you fled from? There was an article uh, that was published in, I think it was The Guardian, 
and it was written by a journalist uh, by the name of Alex Hannaford. And um, he interviewed me uh, for several hours. And uh, he used this word fled, which uh, is a mischaracterization of uh, a time back in 2001 when I left England and I moved back to the States. And to, if I could go back just a few years, um, I well actually go back to the beginning of my training. I uh, graduated from medical school in London in 1988 and um, I underwent uh, seven years of postgraduate training uh, between the uh, United Kingdom and the United States in the fields of uh, general surgery, uh, anesthesiology and interventional pain. And after I had finished uh, my training in the States, I went back to England and I did uh, a further year's training at the Bristol Royal Infirmary in the field of interventional pain. And at that point, I then moved back to London and I went into private practice. Now, it's been well documented and written about extensively. Um, I was involved in a dental case back in 1999, uh, in which a 57-year-old uh, female patient from Sierra Leone uh, was undergoing wisdom teeth extraction. Uh, and as I've talked about before, it was a 17-minute long procedure. Uh, it was an uneventful procedure. Uh, I, the patient was appropriately monitored, uh, was appropriately sedated, and I did not leave the patient's side for one moment. Uh, at the end of the procedure, um, the patient had a cardiac arrest, which sometimes happens when people have anesthesia. She was successfully resuscitated by myself, and she was then transferred uh, to a local hospital. Now, sadly, uh, she passed away six days later, and in the United Kingdom, the medical legal system is very different to that in the United States. And I've talked about this before, but I make this point again to highlight it. In the UK, if a patient passes away under a doctor's care, the physician can be prosecuted criminally. And that's what happened uh, with my case. And I went through the process and uh, was not sent to jail. And after I had been released uh, from the system, I then had to get uh, my life back together. So there was a period of time between the end of that case and me coming back to the United States, which was in September 2001. And it wasn't me fleeing or running away. What it was, very simply, was me picking up the pieces of my life and trying to move on. Uh, I was 36 or 37 years uh, of age at the time. And um, I had spent my whole childhood and adult life uh, uh, going to medical school and training to become a doctor. So I had an opportunity because I had connections and I had a license in the United States. So for me, it seemed like the logical um, solution to my situation. And one that I'm sure anybody who found themselves, unfortunately, in my position, would have done. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the journalist, again, um, in terms of using the word fled, it's a mischaracterization of what actually happened and what I did. And it was intended to create, in the reader's mind, a sense that I was running away from something, which is the furthest thing from the truth. All I was doing was trying to take whatever opportunity I had left to rebuild my life. Mm -hmm. So you didn't go to jail? I did not go to jail. Okay. And what was the outcome of the case? The case uh, lasted approximately four weeks and it was uh, conducted at what's called the Central Criminal Court, otherwise known as the Old Bailey in London. Um, at the end of the four-week trial, uh, there was a 12-person jury. Um, the jury could not come to a unanimous verdict. And in the States, if that situation occurred, it would be declared a mistrial. But in the United Kingdom, criminal convictions can be obtained on a simple majority verdict. And in my case, um, when the, ju uh, the jury could not come to a unanimous verdict, 
the judge gave them a direction that he would accept a majority verdict. So I, I was convicted on a majority verdict. However, uh, about 30 or 40 people had sent letters of recommendation to the judge uh, telling them how competent a physician they thought I was um, and extolling my uh, other virtues of my character. Um, and he read the letters and he, in his final ruling, uh, he felt that imprisonment was not appropriate uh, or immediate imprisonment was not appropriate for my case, and he discharged me from the court. So you were found guilty, but not punished or serving any type of penalty? Yes, I was found uh, guilty uh, under the, um, uh, the med what's called the medical manslaughter statute, but I was not sent to jail. And so why, why was that? So you basically got the guilty verdict, at, but... They didn't remove your license or anything like that? No. Um, the guilty verdict uh, came back in February 2001, and then my license in the United Kingdom uh, was removed in May 2002. I see. So there was a delay before you lost your license. You lost your, they took your license away there. Yes, there was a delay uh, mm -hmm. between the uh, verdict from the court and the action that was taken by the, uh, what's called the General Medical Council. Mm -hmm. So these people that are making the decision in, in, in the case, are these doctors? Or are they just lay people? Uh, the, the people in the court who, uh, or rather the jury, I should say, right. were lay people. Um, there were no doctors uh, in on that jury, um, but there were doctors on the panel at the General Medical Council. And I'm just trying to. So, so, so were, uh, were there doctors who testified one way or the other that can that you know? Yes, during the case, um, there were experts. Uh, physician experts on both the defense and the prosecution uh, side and I actually had the uh, professor of medicine Oxford University uh, as one of my medical experts and uh, when he testified uh, he uh, in his reports and in his testimony he said that the patient had a pre-existing um, potassium imbalance which may which means that before she came into the dental surgery, she had a low potassium. Mm -hmm. And it was that that caused the cardiac arrest. And that there was no way that I could possibly have known that she had a low potassium because in the United Kingdom at that time and in the government dental clinics, they did not routinely uh, do bloods on patients. Mm -hmm. So according to the procedures that you were taught by in the UK, the potassium levels aren't something you would check before giving the anesthesia, is that right? Correct. Is, has, has that changed since then? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. The, uh, the, 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 the National Health Service dental clinics uh, are part of the government-funded healthcare system. And they are always under uh, budgetary or financial constraints. Uh, and the dental clinics uh, s uh, simply did not have the budget to afford to pay for these tests. And, and whilst I'm on this issue of the funding of the National Health Service, in this particular case uh, that I was involved in, uh, and this is a detail that a lot of people don't know because the press never really reported it, was that when the patient was taken uh, from the clinic to the first hospital, they turned her away because they said they didn't have any beds. So she was then transported to a second hospital, uh, which is where she was admitted. So, and then she was looked after by about 12, or 13, 12 to 15 doctors over a period of six days. And I bring that detail up because there are people who say, uh, you know, that would never have happened in the US. The patient would have been admitted at the first hospital and she would have been stabilized and treated. But again in the United Kingdom 
And it's because there is chronic underfunding of the National Health Service. This patient, um, this 57-year-old lady, was turned away from the first hospital and then had to be transported another half an hour to a hospital that had beds. Mm -hmm. So do you, you believe that that delay had an impact on the outcome? I do firmly believe uh, that that delay had a significant impact on the outcome uh, of the patient. I believe that had she been admitted to the first hop hospital and properly treated there, I think there is a much greater chance that she would have uh, lived and would have been alive today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. What was it during the, was there, some, was there something during the actual procedure that there was an accusation that you failed to do or, or, or did that cause this? Yes. Uh, during the uh, uh, trial and actually, in fact, in the run-up to the trial, there was an allegation made by one of the dental assistants that I was supposedly using a mobile or cell phone. That allegation was disproved during the trial because my uh, attorneys, my solicitors, had contacted the telephone company and they sent one of their engineers to court, a Mr. David Bristow, who testified for half a day on the stand about all of the incoming and outgoing calls on my phone number and testified that no mobile phone was being used. After his testimony, the prosecution, or the Crown Prosecution Service, admitted that no phone was being used. They and they put that into writing. There was a submission oh, really? that was really? put into writing by the Crown Prosecution Service that no mobile phone was being used. Mm -hmm. And the problem, and again it goes back to uh, the misrepresentations in the press. Right. At the time, the British press, the BBC, the Telegraph, they misreported. I mean, they well, blatantly lied mm -hmm. about this detail. I mean, even though it was there, it was in black and white, it was in court, they could not have missed that. However, they, how are they going to run a story about a patient who has a cardiac arrest based upon a low potassium? Right. It's a much more sensationalist story. So basically, that was an allegation that the press ran, and but and it was disproved. But um, but the, what you're saying is that you know the impression or the the stain, so to speak, on people's minds is that oh, uh, was he using a cell phone or a cell phone or not? They don't mention in the article that oh, by the way, what we just what was alleged was disproved. They don't put that in the article. Right. Correct. The, 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 uh, the reporting of that detail, that very important detail about the cell phone, because that, that detail was the detail around which the case was built. Mm -hmm. And as soon as that detail was taken out, the case should have been dismissed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. But the press, mm -hmm. knowing that it had been pulled out, decided that they were still going to run with the mobile phone story. So mm -hmm. it had been disproved. But they leave that but they, the article. Correct. Okay. Uh, what kind of phone was it? It was, uh, they, it was a, a mobile phone, allegedly. I mean, that was the, the allegation that uh, oh, oh, mobile. Was there, oh, was there no phone at all in, in the room with you? or you were? No, there was no phone. Oh, I see. So, so it wasn't like you were holding a phone. Or, correct. Or, okay, because you, you, you could not be on the phone on a call and be using a, a smartphone, and but there was no, but you weren't, the, you weren't, you didn't have the phone at all. Yeah, the, fo the, the phone was not in my possession, oh. it was not with me in the room, it was downstairs in the office, really? in the same building, and um, when the engineer um, analyzed, you know, all of the uh, data uh, that was coming into and out of. At that time. At that time. Right. At the critical time. Uh-huh around about 3.15, I think it was, or thereabouts, but he went an hour before and an hour uh, back. He found that there was no activity at all. And that's documented in the, in the case as well? Yes. The, it, this, this detail about the lack of activity, whether it be data or voice, was, was uh, 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 testified to by the engineer, David Bristow, 
and was formally accepted in the form of a submission by the Crown Prosecution Service. Right, so, so the courts, okay, if, if they don't know what they're, and I'm using, you know, it, it, if they, um, you know, uh, uh, know how to prosecute medical cases or not, we'll put that on the side, but in terms of cell phone data, they accepted this company's uh, and, or, or individual professional that their testimony based on the, the data that was provided from the cell phone company. Correct. There was uh, an acceptance by the Crown Prosecution Service uh -huh. uh, in writing right. uh, in what was referred to as a submission yeah. that there was no cell phone usage and they accepted in totality the testimony of the expert, Mr. Okay. David Bristow. So did, did your lawyer say this case should be over right now because of that? Because, uh, I mean, right now, from what you're telling me, I, I, okay, it, that sounds like the, a big detail that would have swayed, right? Because if you're in, an oper in a procedure and you're not paying attention, then someone could die, I guess. Um, but uh, was there other testimony that was given that would make these, why would they be swayed, these people, um, if that critical major factor, you know, was disproved in court? I think um, uh, in talking about my case, which occurred in England, uh, uh, Ms. Bangura, she had the cardiac arrest in March 1999. And the case uh, eventually came to trial in uh, January 2001. And I think what's relevant uh, to my case to understand the genesis of it and what happened during the case, one has to go, or rather I have to go back even a few years prior to the case. When I had returned to England uh, in 1995, and when I went back, my original intention was um, to do my fellowship uh, in England, and then I was going to go to Sydney uh, and spend another year training uh, at the University of New South Wales, and then come back to the States. Um, but as things turned out, I met someone, and I decided to stay on in the UK uh, for a few more years. And one of the consultants at the hospital uh, suggested that I make an application to the Royal College of Anesthetists to have my American training uh, and board certification recognized in the United Kingdom. So uh, I followed his advice and I submitted an application to the Royal College asking them to grant me equivalency. Um, and about six weeks after I had submitted the application, uh, I received a letter from the Royal College saying that they did not consider my American training to be equivalent to that in the UK, um, that they did not consider my American board certification to be equivalent to the British Royal College examination, and that if I were to um, uh, treat British patients, patients and come up to British standards, I would need to undergo a further 18 months of training in a British hospital. So I was a bit surprised and taken aback uh, by their decision because I felt, uh, and I had, trained at one of the largest and best institutions in America. Which one? Uh, I was at Montefiore Albert Einstein in the Bronx, and I had received an excellent training there. So uh, I decided uh, to appeal this decision. And the appeal was the first time that a foreign graduate had taken the Royal College into uh, that legal forum. And it became very contentious. You challenged the, the you know, all, not almighty, but you, know, you challenged these people and they didn't like that. C correct, I did. I, I challenged the British establishment right. um, because I felt their decision was unfair and unjust. And I thought uh, I was within my rights to make that challenge. Uh, yeah. it, there was a, admittedly, some people thought I should have just ignored it and gone back to the States. Uh, but at that time, 
uh, and I was 33 or 34 then, um, you know, that was the decision that I made. And, uh, and so I did. I challenged them. And uh, it's my belief uh, that the uh, contentious nature of that affair um, was a large part of the genesis of the uh, prosecution that I was subsequently submitted to. And, 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 and what I should also uh, make clear is that, and again, a lot of people don't know this because the press never reported it there, and of course the press never reported it here, was that the experts who testified for the prosecution in the United Kingdom were the exact same people who I had taken to the appellate court from the Royal College. So I had brought this to my uh, uh, attorney's attention and I said, look, I said, I think that there's a conflict of interest here. I said, you've got experts for the prosecution who I've just been in a battle with who are now testifying against me. So my question was, how can they be impartial? I said, they can't. Don't you think we should make a motion to have them recused? Um, my attorneys didn't think that was the thing to do, and they, they didn't do it. And, you know, I was, you know, I suppose following their instructions, I didn't really know too much about the legal system. Mm -hmm. But just instinctively, it seemed uh, incorrect and inconsistent with justice that there would be uh, an expert uh, who, clearly, um, uh, was, who clearly was um, or experiencing or or where there was a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. So, but at the end of the day, now you asked me to, to ask you the hard questions, right? Mm. Okay, so, so but at, at the end of the day, they didn't make the decision because maybe they would have just made you guilty because of what you had challenged them on earlier. They testified against you. Do you feel that they, um, you know, embellished or lied in their testimony to sway the jury? I, I do. I feel that um, uh, there was one particular expert, um, her name was Dr. Patricia Flynn, and she was the deputy of the head of the Royal College of Anesthetists. And I feel that her report uh, was overly uh, punitive and her testimony was overly punitive. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what you know. Experts on either side are paid to do. Uh, to uh, it was her job to paint the worst possible picture right. uh, of me and what I had done that day. So I, I understood uh, that part of it. But to go to uh, your question of why did the jury find me guilty, and the only explanation I have uh, for that uh, again relates to a, a, a detail in the case. Um, which again I've, I've talked about uh, briefly uh, in my book that I wrote about the case. Um, and it's this. When I uh, was cross-examined by the Crown Prosecution Service, uh, they had appointed, um, and again this was a kind of an interesting fact, they had appointed the top prosecutor in the country to prosecute my case. And he was very good, um, and he started off uh, his uh, cross-examination by handing me some photographs that his team had taken um, of the dental clinic. Uh, pictures of the kitchen, pictures of the office, pictures of the actual dental clinic. And to cut a long story short, he, uh, he asked me, he saw that I was not wearing a wristwatch. So uh, he, he said to me, on the report that you wrote that day after the case, uh, you put down a specific time on the report. And he says, I see you don't wear a wristwatch. And he says, have you ever worn one? And I said, no. And he said, uh, and where did you get the time from? And I said, I, I looked at the clock. And he says, well, were you in the kitchen or were you in the office? And... I actually was in the kitchen uh, when I had uh, wrote the report, but I, for some reason I said the office. And he said, oh, uh, and was it this clock that you referred to? And I looked at the photograph and 
I, again, I, I don't know why I said the office, because I was in the kitchen. I said, yes, it was. And then he proceeded to show me photographs of that same clock taken on seven different days, and the clock on those photographs was seen to be showing the exact same time every day at different times. So the suggestion was the clock wasn't working, had never worked, and that I had been dishonest about where I'd gotten the time from. How many instances of time were on your report? Just one? One. Was it the time of, the, of what the clock was? No, it was a different time. It was a different time. So, the, I, the, so, so, so why couldn't the clock have died after you, uh, you know, the battery run out after you wrote down the time? It, it, How is that proof? You are correct. That, 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 that is absolutely the case. But the attorneys that I had, when they re-examined me, did not take me down that road. So to answer your question of why the jury came back with the guilty verdict, even though it was a majority verdict, mm -hmm. and people ask me this question, the, that is the only explanation that I have, is that, that somehow that detail was... Uh, used to make uh, or to attack my credibility. And that stuck in the jury's mind and that's what swayed them? Is that, I'm Correct. Sorry, I didn't mean to put words in your mouth there. Yes, I, I, it is, it is uh, I firmly believe that after that point, which was at the beginning of my cross-examination, uh, my credibility in the eyes of the jury had been tainted. Right. And but in, in your, in your cross-examination, your attorneys didn't re refute that, like I just did. I'm not an attorney, but I would, <laughs> I mean, I would, I would say, uh, Your Honor, yeah. uh, who's to say that the clock battery didn't run out after the time I looked at it? C right? Correct. The, the, uh, the, the attorneys, the legal team, the, uh, uh, the barrister, the solicitor, the Queen's counsel, they did not refute that, and uh, that I have to be honest with you, has always been um, uh, something that has troubled me for many years because, um, you know, had they, uh, uh, on their re-examination of me, uh, brought this point up that uh, just because these photographs which were taken a week after the event showed the clock not to be working, that did not prove that the clock was not working at the time. So after... They made you look like you did, and you know, and you didn't think of it. You know, it's, I'm sure it's a stressful situation to be in that courtroom anyway. So, so you didn't think to say, "Wait a second, uh, that was after the fact." Uh, you know, these pictures were taken after I looked at it, right? So you, oh, fine, you didn't, you know, have the wherewithal to come up with that on the spot, and probably neither would 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 many people because you're not an attorney and you don't think that way, but. After that was brought up by the prosecution, it was never handled by your side. C correct. After the attack on my credibility by the prosecution based upon these photographs of this clock, right. it was never uh, adequately rebutted or uh, refuted uh, by my uh, legal team when they cross-examined me. Mm -hmm. it, it was a detail mm -hmm. that uh, went uh, legally unattended. Uh, and in the same way, um, if I could just say that the detail about the mobile phone, when it was first published in the British press, uh, I said to my solicitor, don't you think we should send a letter to the people uh, at the BBC and the Telegraph informing them to make an instant retraction uh, about the issue of the mobile phone? And his response was, it's better just to leave it at this point and not do anything. And again, uh, that was uh, a, a big regret of mine that I didn't push harder uh, to get that detail changed because that detail haunted me for 10 years till I eventually got a hold of the report, got a hold of the letter and sent it to uh, the BBC and the Telegraph mm -hmm. and um, you know, have made people... Uh, who are close to me and close to the case aware of that fact. Okay, so 
can you you, you know it, it, can you get that? I mean, you, do you have that document that that says uh, the you know the document that they accepted from the professional saying there was no cellular data and this phone was not used at all during that time. So whether the phone was in the room or not, it wasn't being used. So could you have that in writing somewhere? Yes, the expert okay. report from David Bristow, I, it is in my possession. Okay, so, you know, perhaps next to, the, you know, next to this video somewhere, wherever you choose to, to put this, maybe you could put that report. Yes. Okay, um, so um, now tell me about the New Jersey case. <clears throat> uh, in April, uh, it, was, it was April, I think, 2012. Um, I was in my office uh, up in Pompton Lakes one day, and uh, I received a phone call uh, from my attorney saying that the um, medical board were about to file a complaint. Uh, against me to uh, either suspend or revoke my medical license. And I was, it was completely out of the blue. I had no idea uh, it was coming. And uh, the, my attorney didn't have any more information other than that. Um, the next day, I received the, um, uh, the summons from the board. And in the summons, they... Uh, the basis for their action uh, was uh, it was their opinion or well, the opinion of their expert uh, who was a neurosurgeon that I was not um, probably qualified to perform uh, these minimally invasive procedures and the thing that I found most surprising and shocking about it was that I had been performing these procedures for 10 years that the medical boards were fully aware of the procedures that I was performing. It wasn't as if I was carrying them out secretly in some back alley. I had opened up a surgical center. I had gone through uh, the Medicare certification process, which requires uh, that the doctor disclose the types of procedures uh, that he or she is going to be performing. Uh, I had even obtained what's called AAA HC certification for the center. And again, uh, within that certification, uh, the physician has to disclose the types of procedures uh, that he or she is going to be performing. So it was uh, common knowledge, uh, widely known, that I was performing minimally invasive discectomies and fusions. Um, so the uh, action taken by the board uh, was, to say the least, a complete surprise. But more worryingly to me, it was just not consistent with the board's actions and the board's regulations and the knowledge that the board had about my practice. Okay, is it the same board that approved your facility with those procedures outlined in the criteria that you, by which you were building this? Uh, is it the same board that then changed their mind? Correct. Yes, it was the... Um, the same board, uh, and that board had been uh, sitting uh, for about uh, five to six years before 2012. Uh, it was that exact same board that had been involved in the approval process for the, for the center. Uh, and it was that exact same board that I had appeared before uh, back in 2009, 2010 to discuss my practice and my training and my education and the cases that I was doing. Now, you said you were doing them for 10 years. Correct. Where were you doing those? Uh, in the 10 years uh, from 2002 to 2012, I performed these procedures uh, in other surgical centers in the state of New Jersey. And are, did you, I mean, you didn't invent this procedure, right? Um, uh, how, how were you able to do these procedures there? <clears throat> uh, at each of the centers uh, that I performed the minimally invasive discectomies and fusions, 
I was um, properly credentialed, I was properly licensed, um, and I was performing procedures legally and within the guidelines and regulations of the facility and my license. Uh, the by, by well, each you were, of the you were, you were certified or by by whom? I was licensed by the state of New Jersey, uh, and my license was for medicine and surgery. The uh, facilities uh, which I performed the procedures, um, for me to obtain privileges, I had to go before a credentials committee and be approved by a credentials committee to perform minimally invasive discectomies and fusions. And when they came to you and said you're not qualified, I'm sure you brought up that you, you, know, you had some documentation that you were passed Right? Or Correct. No? Correct. And what did they say to that? They, uh, uh, their response uh, to the accreditation um, was to fall back on their expert's report. And he just, their expert, who was a neurosurgeon, uh, his response was, oh, in my opinion, he's not qualified or trained. So, they, so, so the, 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 uh, the medical board and the state ignored their own regulations, ignored the position that they had taken for all of these years and did not give an affirmative response to uh, uh, my, my proposition that you guys were fully aware and you authorized me. Mm -hmm. And now you're turning around and saying that it wasn't authorized? It, was, it, it just didn't make any sense. And... and you know this the, my case in New Jersey, uh, and again it's you know again it's no secret because I um, you know really you know when it happened I understood exactly what was going on, and you know in simple terms uh, uh, this was a turf war. It was a very it was it, it was it was like gang warfare. On the one side you had the neurosurgeons, and on the other side the interventional pain physicians. And because I was the most well-known and the busiest, I was the, you know, the most uh, prominent guy on the side of the interventional pain physicians. And the neurosurgeons figured that if they could take me out of the game, that they would ensure that the rest of the interventional pain community didn't continue to do these cases. Um, and, and this is, you know, people find it hard to, you know, people who are not in medicine, you know, would never think that this kind of thing goes on in medicine. I mean, it's been going on for years. I mean, uh, the example I always use is, if you look at cardiology, 25 years ago, uh, when people had a cardiac problem, they would go and see a cardiac surgeon. And invariably, they would have their chest cut open and they would have a stent or a valve put in. Around about that time, the interventional cardiologists started to develop and expand their scope of practice. And they started to work out ways to fix the heart, but by going in through a small vessel. And there was a battle at that time between the cardiologists and the cardiac surgeons, again, over who can and can't do these procedures. And eventually, the interventional cardiologists won out because what they were doing was actually better for the patients. So in that same way, what I was doing and what many other interventional pain physicians have been and now are doing, again, is correcting people's backs, taking away their pain, but doing it in a minimally invasive fashion. There's no need anymore to cut a patient's back wide open, which is how neurosurgeons are trained. These problems can be addressed with the techniques that I started to use and uh, was very instrumental in developing and promoting. So it's, you know, the, it, New Jersey is a relatively small geographic state and, you know, each state in America has its independent or its own medical licensing board. And in this mix, um, of medicine, there's money and there's politics. And that was the combination that 
came together to uh, that led to my license being suspended because and I, and I say this because one of my good attorney friends asked me this question he said what changed he said you were fine for all this time and then something changed what was it and I said well it was you know the the, the political framework changed mm -hmm. I said and, you know I just I'm you know I said I'm not a politician and I don't you know I've never played a political game I said, but the neurosurgeons <laughs> did play that game and, you know, it worked to their advantage uh, in this particular case. I said, mm -hmm. but, you know, things change and, you know, it'll go back the other way. Okay, so again, th those procedures that you're, talk that you're talking about, uh, you didn't invent them, right? Uh, you, this, these, are, these have been done by other doctors in the past and you, you're not doing something that's... That, um, Somebody else is, you know, you're not doing something that's new, technically. Um. You are correct uh, in making that statement that uh, I was not performing uh, a procedure that had not been done before. What I did was I performed it in a minimally invasive fashion. So I performed the procedure using a technique that... Uh, did not require uh, a, a large incision and a wide dissection. But also, and the most, I think, critical point here, was that I performed it in an outpatient setting where I was able to carry out the procedure, the fusion, and have the patient go home the same day. That was something that had never been done. And that... Uh, uh, because it was so revolutionary, that is what brought so much attention and focus on me and that case. You have to understand, uh, in the state of New Jersey, you have uh, big hospital systems. And on the other side, uh, you have these surgical centers that are mostly owned by doctors and physician groups. And what I did was I took a particular case which had been a huge revenue generator for these hospital systems, and I had moved it into the outpatient surgical setting. There were many advantages to that. One, the patient gets to go home the same day. Two, there's a much lower incidence of hospital, or, in, or a much lower incidence of infection. Patients that go into hospitals and have to stay there for three or four or five days pick up hospital-acquired infections. And when you have back surgery and the infection gets to the screws or the implants, it can be very serious. Uh, and three, doing these cases in an outpatient setting is a much more financially uh, sensible uh, model than doing them in hospitals where the bills can be astronomical. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay, now you've got attorneys on your side here, didn't they argue the case? Or did this go to court or they just suspended it and that's it? After the license was suspended, uh, the hearing, uh, there was a hearing scheduled in the Office of Administrative Law, which is, it's not quite a court, it's a, um, it's a tribunal almost, but it's, co it's called the Office of Administrative Law. Oh, I see. And there was a, there was a hearing there um, but the, uh, the outcome of my case, um, it, you know, as I've since found out, it, it was, you know, this was a political decision. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we presented a very strong case legally. It was a very strong, uh, well thought out and argued case. We brought in experts mm -hmm. from around the country who testified that this area of medicine has moved into the interventional pain and interventional radiology communities uh, and that in me performing these cases I had not uh, breached any standards of care. But regardless um, of the uh, strength of our case, uh, it was, and I don't quite know what word to use, I mean it was rigged. Uh, you know, it was prejudged. So there was no, uh, 
uh, it wasn't as if uh, I could have expected any other outcome other than the one that occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, because, it, it, you know, it, 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 very simply, this was just about politics and money. So, so the decision was made by, a, like, a board. It wasn't, it wasn't like, in a, in a courtroom situation. It was made by people that can, you know, make their own decisions, and it's, it's not, uh, you know, it, 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 can, can they be sued? Can you sue them? Uh, the process... Uh, that's occurred with the hearing going first of all to the Office of Administrative Law. There was a, a judge there, um, everyone knows his name is Judge Howard Solomon. He made um, a ruling and a decision and that ruling and decision then went back to the medical board which by the way has since been changed. So that medical board that's actually sat on my case at the beginning of 2014 has since been changed. Um, and he, he, to, to, to answer um, your question uh, about legal recourse, the answer is yes. Uh, there is legal recourse um, to this issue. Um, it, is not, uh, it, it would not be found in the state courts. It would be found in the federal courts. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, very simply, uh, yes, there, there, there are legal remedies to the... Uh, you know what I believe are the wrongs that have been co been committed. Right. So this is not a case that can be fought. You know, without. The, the, I, I I'm, I'm hearing. Uh, you know, Supreme Court type stuff. Is that is that is that correct? Okay. So this, so so for you to fight this, you'd have to, you'd have to fight it with you know. A, 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 millions of dollars of legal fees and, you know, to change uh, the, uh, the, the verdict, so to speak, or the decision that they made. Correct. I got you. Which, probably hard to do. Well, uh, y yes and no. Um, uh, as I've been going through this, uh, uh, or rather, as I was going through this case, uh, I had the foresight uh, during the hearing in the Office of Administrative Law uh, to bring my own transcriptionist to court because I felt that there was might have been some funny business with the transcripts and um, and lo and behold there was and at critical points in the testimony of their expert Dr. Przybilski they had changed parts of his testimony to support their case. Well, you don't know that they changed it. It was just different for some reason, right? It was significantly okay. different. Okay. So I took um, my comparison and I drafted a letter mm -hmm. and I sent a letter about uh, the transcription uh, fraud and the fact that it was an unconstitutional board. Okay, Let this, let's, just, I'm sorry. let's just back up a second. There are two transcriptionists in the courtroom? Correct. And didn't they see the other one? They did. And yet they still, I mean, l let's just say, let's give them the benefit of the, of the doubt and, and say it was some, some computer deletion error, right? Mm. And not accuse anybody of anything, but, but if they were to change something, they, 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 <laughs> they knew that somebody else was in the room taking the same thing. So, Correct. And actually, on uh, the specific day, which was May the 6th, when Dr. Przybilski actually admitted under cross-examination that there are no standards uh, for education and training in minimally invasive spine surgery. There was in the courtroom also a reporter from Orthopedics This Week who subsequently wrote an article about that day and in his article he said Przybilski admitted that there were no standards. And you have that article? And the, Yes, mm -hmm. correct. I am in possession of that article and also in the courtroom, all of the proceedings were recorded uh, on an audio file as well. So, um, And they didn't match the transcripts that they presented? Correct. Who did they present them to? Uh, the, the court transcripts, uh, the stenographer uh, who was there, uh, was paid for by the court, gave those transcripts afterwards to the medical board and the um, uh, the people, or the Attorney General's office, I should say, 
And the people who were going through the transcripts in the Attorney General's office were the ones most likely to have made the changes. Okay. All I can say, though, uh, is that there were material changes that were uh, uh, between th those transcripts and my transcripts. And when I uh, discovered this, I sent a letter. I sent a letter to the president, I sent a letter to Governor Christie, and I sent a letter to the president of the medical board, bringing uh, their attention to this. And I sent a letter to the judge, asking that there be a full investigation of the irregularities in the transcripts. Uh -huh. I did not receive one response uh, from any of these bodies that I sent out these letters, which I sent recorded, uh, regular, and FedEx uh, mail. Uh, however, the medical board that sat on my case at the start of this year has since been changed by the governor uh, of this state. Uh huh. So, just to the, repeat the. the so, it, it, the decision was made by the board, and then. Why did it get to the attorney general? So were they the? Was he the one, or uh, was that the office that was supposed to revoke your license? Or why did it? Why did it go from the medical board into the transcriptions? Right, those transcriptions occurred in the medical board. Correct. Uh, hearing, or so, so to speak. Correct. The the the, the anomaly uh, in New Jersey again, which the public in New Jersey don't know, and there's no reason for them to know, is that there is no division of power between the medical board and the attorney general's office. So what happens is that it's a process where um, you have the judge, jury, and prosecution all being one and the same. So the case was meant to be prosecuted by the attorney general's office, but they are part of the same administrative body to which the medical board belongs. So the people, uh, uh, you've, you have, uh, you know, uh, the simplest way to say it is you have the judge, jury, and prosecutor all sitting on the same side. Mm -hmm. um, and that is um, an oddity of the way uh, the uh, process is configured in New Jersey. It's very different in um, New York. Uh, it's very different in Pennsylvania. Um, what was omitted from the version that was presented to the Attorney General that differs from what you have? Uh, Dr. Przybilski's admission that there are no standards for training in minimally invasive spine surgery. That was the crux of the case. That, that was the key element of the case that they had brought. Because if there are no standards for education and training in minimally invasive spine surgery, then he can't say that I'm not properly qualified or trained right, because there are no standards. Right. You can't break a law that's not written. Correct. Or, you know. um, so how many of the 6,000? 6,000. Uh, how many were these? Um, so in a sense, you created or uh, merged two well-known practices of, you know, minimally invasive surgery and the spinal fusion, and that hadn't been done before. Correct. I see. So how many of those, how many of the 6,000 were uh, those types of surgeries? Uh, out of the uh, uh, 6,000 procedures uh, that I'd performed over 10 years, 800 um, fell into the category of minimally invasive discectomies and fusions. And that's what they said you weren't qualified to do? That is uh, what the um, uh, board and Dr. Przybilski alleged I was not qualified to perform. Okay. Now, I'm trying to run the numbers here. You said that the, per the percentage of cases with, um, what's the word, uh, uh, problems, uh, you know. Complications. Complications. Do you know that that was that was one percent or something? What was the uh, the, the the accepted range yeah. was between five to twenty percent. Okay. Uh, in the medical literature, right. 
uh, my complication rate uh, in those 800 uh, cases was 0.1 percent. And how many fell under that? Now that you—that's for the whole 6,000, or that's just the 800, or the uh, well, that the, that was for the 800. The 800. Yeah. Okay. 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 So that was for the 800. All right. Um, okay. So in effect, or wait, wait. So wait. Point. How can you have? Oh, how can you have 0.01? I'm not a math guy. 0.01 percent. Point oh one percent. That has to equal one, like the, at least one patient. The, 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 the correct, correct. So was it one out of eight? The, in eight in eight hundred patients, it, there was only uh, one patient where I had uh, what could be considered an actual complication. And this is all documented. It's all documented. Okay, and you also have a lot of cases. <laughs> I guess seven hundred and ninety-nine that. Um, they, they, they had successful outcomes. Yes, and to, to go to uh, uh, all of the patients that I had treated successfully, uh, there was a petition that over a thousand people, including all of the patients that I had treated, uh, signed, and uh, uh, the petition was sent to uh, Governor Christie and to the medical board. Mm -hmm. um, so it. it, it, it the, the 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 facts of my practice uh, demonstrate that I've had a very low complication rate, uh, a very good outcome ratio, and that uh, I've had a lot of patients who I've helped, and uh, through these legal proceedings that have supported me uh, in one way or another. Okay, so how much... Oh, now, now, is there anything else as far as anything against you or like any, we'll, we'll call it, uh, uh, any other, bad, bad things any other there. dirt? No, that's it. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's it. it. So, so, yeah. so there's the thing that happened in Britain yeah. and in the UK and, and then there's, there, there's this here. Uh, is, was it a permanent suspension of your license here? It was a revocation. A revocation of your? Yeah. So, so that's 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 forever. No, I, I, I am I am legally allowed uh, to reapply for my license, which I am in the process of doing so. Okay, and do you have to go through like some other hoops or schooling? Or yes. Yeah, so, so, so uh, uh, the proposal actually that uh, we're putting forward is uh, one of my colleagues has agreed to be a monitor uh, for me for a period of six months. Uh, and he, he even said to me, it's a bit of a joke, he goes, you'll teach me actually what to do. Um, but uh, he's agreed to be a monitor. Uh, he'll submit reports. But then why would they have him be your monitor? If, if, uh, oh, 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 because he, he's, he's technically certified or... Uh, no, I mean, he's, uh, I, I've, I have agreed uh, to, to come, as I'm coming back in, mm -hmm. to uh, limit my practice to interventional pain. So he's going to be, you know, he's board certified and qualified in, in interventional pain. And um, you're not going to do the minimal, minimally invasive surgeries? Not initially, no. Okay. I put it in some, at some point in the future? Yes. I mean, I, uh, uh, once I have uh, obtained my license and, um, you know, I'm going to then subsequently make a reapplication to the board uh -huh. and, you know, go before them and... Uh, hopefully convince them that you know I should be granted privileges to perform these procedures based upon my training and my education and my record mm -hmm. um, how much of the motivation behind the uh, political act of aggression towards you by revoking your license, do you think was, you know, <clears throat> these are this, what you're alleging, which is fine, this is your opinion, um, how much of that do you think was, was spurred by the case in the UK that was potentially inappropriately or um, 
wrongly spread in the press there based on the omission of the cell phone argument, <laughs> right? So, you know, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so in the UK, you're, you're, you're bashed in the press, right? Uh, you know, wrongly, yeah. from what you're saying. Yeah. Um, hold on, you're, you're, you're moving your... You're, you're oh, sorry. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> in, the, in the UK, well, from what you're saying, you were wrongly characterized by the press based on the omission of the, you know, of, of the cell phone argument that was disproved. Now, what, how, how was this, you know, do you think this was motivated at all by that bad press you got in the UK? Uh, I think, um, and I've been asked this question by uh, other people, uh, I think I've, you know, in some ways <laughs> had just a bout of bad luck and uh, one thing has led on to another. But uh, the, the case in the UK, uh, which, you know, I, I really felt was uh, uh, a, a case that should never have been brought, but it was reported very uh, negatively. And um, as I have explained before, this detail of the mobile phone, which went unaddressed at the time, continued to haunt me. But I think the case with the medical board in New Jersey, I think the major part of it uh, relate, related to uh, the business of medicine. Mm -hmm. But I was an easy target. I think I was an easy target because of the case in England. And I think that it, uh, that made it easier for them to use my history to paint me in a very negative light. Uh, so so it, 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 instead of uh, there being a rational, sane discussion about, okay, what's this guy doing? What's his practice about? Let's look more closely and methodically at it. There was a, a knee-jerk response, and because of the case in England, they thought, uh, and I was, an easy target, easier. Uh, and then, again, the, you know, the local press and the British press you know, rehashing the same story. And so, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, through... Uh, setting up my own website and using the internet have been able to uh, now come out and address some of these points, uh, which I wasn't able to uh, back in 2001. Uh, and again, uh, to kind of go back to uh, how we started the interview, uh, that's really uh, a large part of the reason that I'm sitting here today uh, uh, talking and discussing these points again, because I think that, um, you know, as, as far as uh, the viewing public or people who've been following my case are concerned, the more that they hear from me and the more that they are able to understand what went on in England and what went on here, uh, the easier it's going to be for them to see both sides uh, of the story and not just the sensationalist versions that are put out by uh, some sectors of the press. Great. Well, good. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, um, pretty uh, satisfied. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to ask you, uh, you know, as many questions as I can to get to the bottom of it. Is, is there any? Uh, anything that we're, that we're leaving out in terms of what you feel you want or need to say? No, I, I think this interview um, has covered uh, actually probably more than any other interview in uh, uh, more detail the points of the case uh, that I feel have always been uh, the sticky points, uh, the points that uh, haven't ever been discussed or haven't ever been explained um, and so I, I think uh, you know, that, that, that for me uh, was the main goal of the interview and I think it's, I think it's been achieved.
Excellent. So um, what can people do to, you know, look up or <clears throat> view some of the documentation that you're that you're going to put out there? What, what, what can they do it as next steps if they if they want to, you know, look at some of the stuff or, or um, you know, uh, where can they go to find the, the things that you're talking about? Yeah, I, I, I um, uh, uh, whenever I'm asked questions about my case, I send people uh, to my website. And, you know, on the website, uh, all of the uh, legal documents, uh, for those that are interested, uh, are on the website. And they can go in and they can read uh, these various legal documents that support uh, what I've said in this interview. Uh, and, you know, the website is uh, www drrichardcall.com All right. Thanks. Thank you. Excellent, Greg. Ah, that, that was that was that was great. Did um, even you didn't know? I mean, it's it was an education for you, right? It was. I mean, yeah. it, you know, because it, because I mean, I read the articles as well. Yeah. And. It, There was nothing that connected all the dots. Right. So I asked you a little bit about the, the original case. Yeah. Why you, you know, your your uh, opinion on why it was wrong, or what, what you know, the the, the, the incorrect outcome of, of that, and then of this, I, I, I yeah, I got the education that uh, that hopefully people, oops, yeah. hopefully people. Uh,